Thanks for that, Denise, and it was better than mine. Uh, I'll talk to Damien after this one and say why. But um, look, we've got four sessions coming up. Uh, this is the, uh, the Nick and um, Matt and Dan show, so they're, um, they're prepping already. We've got 45 minutes a session. I'm hoping to carve 10 minutes off for question and answers at the end, so save them at the end. Just to remind you, each of the themes has one or more really experienced scientists and then one new um, PhD student coming through. So you'll get to see different stages of careers and different stages of projects as well. So if I could ask Matt to step forward and introduce <coughs> while we seamlessly and magically transition to here, Dirk. Thanks, Brett. And hello, everyone. Yeah, so uh, Matt Vanderclift. Um, many of you know me, and I know you. So good. Thanks for thanks for coming along and uh, hearing what we have to say. And for those who don't know me, uh, I've been. I have been. <laughs> for those who don't know me, I have been working at Ningaloo for a while. I started working at Ningaloo in two thousand and four. And initially I was working on kind of the reef life, doing a little bit of work on fish, um, not very much on corals, but I was, you know, my PhD is actually in botany and I was particularly interested in marine plants. So I was looking at things like the seagrasses and the seaweeds. And one of the things that struck me was that there's lots of things swimming around eating the seagrass and seaweed. And so I figured, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And so in 2013, I uh, went up to Ningaloo with Scott Whiting and started learning how to become a turtle ecologist as well as uh, just a marine botanist. And so 2013 turned into 2015 and the inception of Ningaloo Outlook program. So uh, we've been going 10 years now and um, learned a lot in 10 years I'm just going to try and really hit the hit the tops um, hit the wave tops in terms of telling you uh, some of the things that, that we've learned over those 10 years and then I'm going to hand over to to uh, Nick and to Dan to drill into a couple of those things a bit more so why are we working on turtles and, and why the interest in turtles well um, you might know of IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and their red list that they use as a way to assess the conservation status of species around the world. There is one for uh, all of the turtles, all of the sea turtles, including the green turtle, and the green turtle one was updated uh, just a few months ago. And that update still has green turtles listed internationally as endangered. And one of the ways that they were doing that was to look at um, a bunch of index sites, 32 index populations around the world. Most of those have been declining over the last decades, as in there are fewer turtles now than they were, there were a few decades ago. Now, these are nesting beaches, so they're counting females, reproductively uh, mature females that are coming up onto the beach to nest. Mostly declining, average decline, around about 43%, worse in the Indian Ocean. Um, 12 index beaches in the Indian Ocean, nine of them declining, and some of those declines have been quite catastrophic. So in places like Indonesia and Myanmar, um, there's only maybe a couple of hundred turtles where there used to be thousands. And it could have been the same in Western Australia. So this is an image from 1923 um, during a period where there was yes the Panama hat. It's a very very striking pose there. Um, so 1923 so there was turtle fishery operating for a while at that stage and that photo taken in 1923, incidentally, is at Point Sampson. So the, the fishery operated around the northwest, including, uh, including parts of Ningaloo, but around, around the, further around the northwest. And that <laughs> anecdote, in that turtle, uh, in that photo, those turtles that they're catching, you can see the very large turtles, and they're loading it onto 
a, a steamship with a freezer hold. That steamship was called the Mindaroo. So there you go. And uh, just 10 years later, 10 years later, the Mindaroo ran aground on a reef at Port Headland and um, was demolished and sold off for scrap metal. So that occurred for a few decades until 1973 when the fisheries minister stopped the fishery. But in those decades, uh, Brock Halkyard estimated that there were more than 60,000 turtles were harvested from the northwest coast. And the, there was a minimum size of a turtle that could be harvested. So we're talking about large animals, reproductive animals. It, as I say, it could have happened in WA, but it didn't. So, 1923 to 2023, so this is just a few weeks ago, uh, off Graveyards Beach at Ningaloo. So this is the aggregation of females that have come to nest and the males that have come to meet the females that have come to nest, and there are thousands of turtles. Now, there was an estimate by Andrea Whiting a few years ago that said that uh, the, the population of breeding females at Ningaloo was somewhere between sort of 15 to 30,000. Uh, a great number of those uh, at Ningaloo this year. It's a really big season. So essentially what I'm saying is this area is a conservation success story. And Ningaloo is or the northwest population of green turtles is the biggest one in the Indian Ocean, one of the biggest ones in the world. It is globally important and it is regionally very important. So, you know, the things that we're trying to find out about it are we're looking at a conservation six six story and what can we learn that might be able to be transferred around the rest of the world as well as being applied in Australia and in Western Australia. Uh, Brett mentioned that there are various documents that set the framing for what we're doing, including the recovery plan for marine turtles, as well as uh, marine park management plans, as well as long-term monitoring for, for Ningaloo. Now, we're not, we're not responsible for any of those. We just That sets the framing, helps us to think about the things we need, and it sets the kind of questions that we try and ask. So some of those important questions are things like, well, you know, what are that, what's their movement like? How many of them are they? How old are they? And, and those are important questions that help us uh, understand ecology, population ecology, and so on. So one of the basic tools in, in the toolbox when you're studying turtles is, of course, satellite tagging. And we have now satellite tagged almost 50 turtles uh, over that time. Initially, we were looking at everything, including nesting females. The plot on the left is tags of nesting female turtles. So we did 13 of those. You can see the, the pattern. Essentially, none of the females that uh, nest at Ningaloo stayed at Ningaloo. They all left um, and went anywhere between the Kimberley and Shark Bay. So that's a span of about 2,000 kilometers of coast. One of the important... So there's lots we can do with that data, but some of the important information that we can extract from that is the sorts of threats that my, they might encounter along the way. And it gives us some comfort to know that of the things that can kill an adult female turtle, there's relatively few. So among them include shipping strikes, and that does happen, and it is a source of mortality. And, and in fact, we've, we've captured turtles that have recently been hit by boats, and they, they're looking distinctly peaky. And so it is probably uh, a reasonable source of mortality. Um, but not enough to stop the population from, from increasing. And apart from that, there's not too many. Now, there are things that can interfere with turtles at other stages of their life, things like lights um, that will interfere with hatching and, and so on and so on. Um, and that's where we think about the right-hand plot. So on the right-hand plot, that's 28 turtles that we've caught in the water and are not part of the reproductive population. And so what do they do? Well, they don't go very far. So they are what we're calling resonant turtles. They mostly hang around in a very small area. And that small area you know, depends on how big they are. When they're, when they're yeah, big, you know, that area is very, very small and it's close to shore. When they're, you know, when they're out around the size where they are reproductively mature, that area is around a few square kilometres. 
except occasionally, as you see there, they'll do a little pop around to somewhere else, and those are, for example, uh, the points in the Gulf are a male that went looking uh, for a mating aggregation. It was a large male, 90-odd centimetres, that went around to the Gulf in October, November, which is when mating occurs. Now, there was one part of that story that we didn't have that is very hard to get, which is the complete migration story of a resident turtle. So in order to get that, we had to find the turtles that were going to nest in the coming season and put a tag on them before they started their migration. That was a tricky thing to do, um, but we managed to do it. Um, you took um, some some lessons from, from Tony and used a, a a portable ultrasound and started catching large female turtles in around October, November before nesting season and scanning them. And luckily, I'm, you know, one of the first turtles I tried that on had these kind of developing egg follicles that you can see in the top right already. Okay, and you know, pop a tag on. So we managed to do that. You know, it ca you've got to catch lots and lots of turtles. Um, and then kind of cross your fingers and wait. We've got four turtles now that have successfully done this. Um, they've all done the same thing. So you can see they wander out, um, sort of head north, then pop over to Barrow Island uh, and the Montebello Islands, and then come back. That's a, that's a journey that takes them some three or four months. They all show strikingly similar patterns, which is great, uh, except they didn't all so the same pattern there there's you know nature is wild and variable and wonderful so this is the fifth one which i thought was doing exactly the same thing except swam past barrow island swam past montebello islands and kept going and started wandering and went 500k out into the indian ocean and then literally did a u-turn and came back but only came back and ended up somewhere near dampier navigated its way through the dampier archipelago back to the Montebello Islands, nested, and then you can see all these kind of loops. It seemed, you know, it looks to all intents and purposes like it got completely lost, didn't know where it was, and then in the end it said stuff it, uh, here, and, here is good enough, and it settled down in the Dampier Archipelago and stayed there uh, for the rest of the tracking duration. So, who knows what's going on? Most turtles are doing what turtles do, leave from their home, nest, come back home, um, but not all of them. At the moment, you know, sample size is pretty small. As I say, it's hard work. You can follow along at home. Um, turtle viewer, thanks, Dirk. Uh, and there are three turtles that are currently transmitting at the moment, including one that has just left the nesting beach just two days ago. You can tell all sorts of things from this. I'm going to start skipping through quickly now, uh, including nesting uh, frequency in terms of number of nests laid. This is really important. I mentioned the, the Andrea Whiting population estimates. That's based on inferences on of how many nests and how many nests per turtle to try and generate and how many nesting events a turtle makes over the course of years to try and generate some numbers. Well, you need to kind of make some, some decisions about how many nests per turtle. We've been able to do that by looking really closely at that small handful of, of turtles. So the answer is somewhere between four and eight. How old is a turtle? Um, shout out to, to Ben. We wanted to know how old the turtles were because that's really important when it comes to population modeling, really fundamental parameter when it comes to population modeling, but it's really hard to do. And uh, you can kind of use the, the arm bones of a dead turtle to try and find out a partial answer, but it's a partial answer. It doesn't give you the answer. So Ben um, uses epigenetic aging. So that's kind of DNA voodoo. Um, but what he's essentially doing is take it, getting DNA and creating a molecular clock, calibrating that with known age turtles from captive populations that we've got from a couple of different parts of the world, the blue dots there are taking that molecular clock that Ben's developed, applying that to wild Ningaloo turtles. The red dots with the lines are from turtles that we have captured more than once, and so we actually know how much it grows. And so essentially, this is a work in progress, but essentially what it's saying is, so they're getting to reproductive maturity, we think, you know, around the, the sort of that 
25 to 30 years they're growing really quickly and then they even off, even off growth slows down and then they're getting to more than 50 years old um, we think as I say work in progress um, how many are there we're using drones I'm going to skip through this um, Nick flies drones someone else looks at drones Oceane's not here but she's done many many drone photos she finds a turtle Nick will talk about it I won't um, but what I will talk about very briefly is how many turtles are there. So of all the turtle, all the surveys that we've done um, that Nick will talk about that are big enough for us to start getting some confidence, um, we're getting an, an answer of around about 10 turtles per square kilometre. So you do the math and you figure out that um, that's roughly one turtle that you can see in an area 300 metres by 300 metres. Um, but that's only the turtles that we can see from a drone looking down. Uh, we got to figure out how many turtles are there actually. And I'm not going to talk about that because Dan's going to talk about it, I think. Um, oh, there's other stuff we can find out. I didn't really expect this and haven't looked into this detail in detail yet. All those dots are where we've seen a turtle using drone images. You can kind of see patterns start and appear. The dots are not over the sand. There's no food on the sand. The dots are over other habitats. And so there's the opportunity for us to get lots of information. Um, imagine that a satellite tag gives us lots and lots of information for one turtle. This is getting very little information, but for lots and lots of turtles. Um, and so there's you know, potentially a lot of utility in, find, in using those images to get other information. So how's my time going, Anth? We're all right, well, less time for the PhD student. <laughs> all right, so nesting turtles, they're coming from all over the shop. Um, Non-nesting turtles, they they really uh, stay at home, except when they nest and then they're going to the Pilbara. Mostly they come home, sometimes they don't. Uh, turtles are growing really quickly for the first couple of decades of their life and then they really slow down um, and they're getting, you know, they're... they're they're old, um, they're over 50 years old, we're still working on the exactly lifespan, total abundance, work in progress. Um, it varies from place to place, um, but it's quite high. Um, lots of shout outs. Um, thank you to the lots and lots of people who have helped over, over 10 years, many of whom are in this room. Uh, so thank you to you all. Um, and then Nick, is going to take over from here. Yes. Better, better, better make sure there's some time left for our PhD student there. Um, that's number three. Okay, I'll go there. Click on that. Have we got a clicker? Does this clicker work is the question. Depression sets in. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'll do it. I have to stand here with a long arm. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm going to make this quick because I want to reverse some time for, for Dan. Um, we started doing some drone surveys. We're just using a standard commercial, a uh, standard sort of... Um, a standard drone that you'd buy down a drone shop, basically. We do have more expensive drones, but for this one, we've been using a P4 RTK and the conducting surveys. When we first started, this is a typical survey, about 300 hectares at Mangrove Bay. Then we started another survey, and another survey, another one, another one, another one, another one. And then we were getting on a bit, and we thought, oh, we've got over 80 surveys. And I'm a bit of a programmer type, so a warning, warning, references to code coming up. Because we started thinking like we've got over 120 uh, kilometers of surveys and 90,000 images and lots of SD cards. And if you've ever tried to manage all that kind of data, it's really annoying. So uh, we've been developing some uh, scripts which are available on um, on GitHub uh, to take all this, uh, extract EXIF data um, from them, and then uh, go into QGIS and draw a box around you where you think your survey area is, then run some more code. And then lo and behold, it validates where you are and where people have been and uh, assigns a real name to your files. There you go. Real name, stores them all nicely. And then we go around there calculating real world coordinates. Again, more code. Those real code coordinates, they take each pixel and work out where it is in the real world. And then we pass on the pictures to Ocean. 
who uh, I'd say passed them on to Ocean because um, I've looked at a few. Ocean's actually looked at 60,000 drone images for us. Um, and she still does it, which I find amazing. So she's found a drone, uh, found a, a turtle in this image. She's extremely good at finding turtles. And what amazes me about AI, the AI models we've trained so, uh, tried so far haven't been anywhere near as good as a seven-year-old. Seven-year-olds, I can go to a classroom and say, find me the turtle, and they'll find the turtle really easily. Um, our our um, latest AI model that we tried was something like 50-50 on what was a rock and what was a turtle. And as you can see in this image, there are lots of rocks. So um, then we do uh, a bit more conversion. We take those uh, turtles into the real world and uh, we then plot them. So you can see those are all the turtles we've found on that particular survey. Now, of course, each image overlaps. So you get four or five looks at the same turtle. So we then run more code, more code to group turtle together. And I look at these predictions. So there's a few things we do, like look at the time between images and work out if there's two images in the turtle in one, in one image, it can't be the same turtle because there's two of them. So you can see there you've got overlapping images with two, two turtles in the same images and it successively tracks the two turtles and comes up with a, um, comes up with a, uh, oh, these yellow dots. Each one of the yellow dots represents one turtle and a sighting and from that then we can then um, get the statistics for for Matt and also um, we can start building a train uh, data set because um, now of course Ocean has boxed put a box around all those turtles and so far we've found nearly 2,000 images of a turtle so when we started this we thought by the time we finished doing all this and going through all our images, somebody else will have developed an AI tool that will be really handy and it will all just work. Unfortunately, we haven't quite got to that point. So now we're going to release, release to the public a training set. And I think, I mean, I think if we're talking statistics, I think it'll be the largest turtle training set available, I think, in shallow water. And there we go. This is a, a, a quick montage of every turtle we've found so far, <laughs> played at high speed. And you can see how on different days, uh, these are all just turtles that have been tagged with close to the surface uh, to make it easier to understand. And you can see on different days, there's a uh, different sun glint, there's all kinds of different artifacts there. And you can see how good Ocean actually is at finding turtles. Thank you. How was that? Time. How do I stop the crazy? It's, it hasn't been yet. <laughs> Move on. Where are we? Okay. Here. Presentation down for you. It's fine or not? Sit. Yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Daniel. I'm the PhD student for the uh, Turtle um, Program for the Ningaloo Outlook Program. Uh, so Matt is my supervisor. Um, so my PhD research is um, basically trying to understand turtle detectability um, during these drone surveys that uh, we're doing. So this, um, this is trying to assist and augment um, that question that Matt um, previously alluded to was, you know, how many turtles are there? Um, so with this turtle detectability, um, there's two components that my research is looking at. So one is the uh, turtle detection probability and the other is the turtle diving behaviour. Um, oh, what's happened there? Sorry. Um, and so the, the idea, um, the aim of my uh, research is to refine the drone survey methodology that um, we're currently implementing in order to enhance the, the accuracy of the estimates of the numbers that we're getting. So this detection probability, this you can just think of simply as the, you know, the chance that we detect a turtle um, during a drone survey for, for any given set of um, conditions. So there's several um, variables that affect um, the ability to detect turtles uh, during these drone surveys. So for example, the, uh, the turtle depth in the water column, uh, the water turbidity, the sea state, um, the, the benthic habitat, so whether it's a sand floor, reef flats, uh, seagrass, algal pavement. Um, the time of day, so things like that can affect, you know, the sunlight and glare. 
um, and also things like the drone altitude or the, the drone camera specs. So as you saw with uh, Nick's little uh, fancy video at the end, there's you know, a varying uh, conditions throughout the day when we're doing these drone surveys and that can have a, a really big effect on our um, ability to detect these turtles. Uh, so the second component of my research is looking at um, turtle diving behaviour. So as you could expect, um, the way that these turtles um, you know, spend their time at depths can uh, influence our ability to detect, um, detect them during these drone surveys. Um, so I'm mainly concerned with what's called the depth usage data. So you can think of this as just the proportion of time um, spent at various depths. Um, so, uh, so you can simply think that if this, these turtles are at depths that the drones just can't detect them, then we're, we're not detecting the turtles or we can't count them. So we have to understand that to know what, what's the depths um, of these turtles that we're, sorry, what is, what is the depth ranges that uh, these turtles are at where we're not detecting them. And that's in order to uh, get more accurate estimates of our numbers to correct the raw count, sorry. So here I just wanted to show quickly, um, this is just a representative turtle that was um, tagged with a satellite tag. So here you can see um, on average, I don't know if you can see that, but on the left here you can see this for this turtle, this was just an average uh, um, time spent at various depths um, across, oh geez, <laughs> across the entire period that we had it. So for example, looking at the top, so zero to one meters, so you could sort of, for all intents and purposes, say, you know, surface, it's spending roughly 20% of its time at the surface. And so for the same turtle as well, we can see over a 24 hour period, we can see the variation in the, uh, the, you know, the depth usage. So more during the day compared to the evening. So yeah, understanding and quantifying this depth usage is important to um, eventually get our accurate estimates of numbers. So I'll come to that though. So the first to understand and quantify this detection probability. So um, what I've done is, oh, sorry. What I've done is um, set up these really systematic and rigorous experiments with drones, which took a lot of programming. But um, so what I'm doing is uh, with both drones and turtle decoys. So here you can see a turtle decoy that I've, I've made out of core flute and printed. So these are put out in the water. So here you can see turtle decoys at various depths. And this is done at various sites throughout the Mangrove Bay area in the Ningaloo Marine Park. Um, so turtle decoys at different depths and then at each of these sites across, you know, our, each say for, for every hour across a day, across a number of days, the drone is flying the exact same flight path. What it does is it centres itself basically looking at the turtle decoys and will do a full 360 capture of the, the, drone, um, of the turtle decoys while also um, making changes to things like the altitude as well as the camera angle. So we're trying to account for all the different things that can influence the, um, the detection of these turtle decoys to then understand, well, for a real turtle, what's, you know, um, pretty much what I'm trying to say, sorry, is that we're trying to calculate what's called a detection zone. So we're trying to find, um, I guess, a depth range at which we can detect these turtle decoys um, while trying to account for all the various factors that can influence that. So such as, as I said, the decoy depths, the drone altitude, the camera angle, the environmental conditions that change throughout the day, as well as the um, habitat, the benthic habitat types. So once we have these detection zones, the next step is then trying to understand, okay, well, what's the proportion of time that these turtles actually sp spend in those detection zones? And so the way we've gone about this is through analysing their turtle, uh, sorry, is analysing their diving behaviour, um, particularly their depth usage. And we've done this through acoustic tagging. So what we've done is for 26 turtles, um, we've tagged them with uh, acoustic tags that have both a depth and um, temperature sensor on them. Um, and these turtles were captured and tagged um, in the Mangrove Bay area. And this just coincided with the fact that um, there's already exist from previous um, from previous years that there's a dense array of acoustic receivers throughout the Mangrove Bay area. And so each time one of these turtles with an acoustic tag um, comes within proximity of the acoustic receiver, it'll ping off its current depth in the water column as well as the temperature, but we're mainly concerned with that depth. Um, so now thinking that we're looking to get those detection zones, what is the depth that we can actually detect these turtles at? And then combining that with, well, this is the proportion of time they spend at those detection depths, we can then calculate what's called the, the detection probability. 
Um, and so this is that proportion of turtles that are actually observable during our drone surveys that we're conducting. So if you look here, this is sort of the process pipeline of how we're getting to our final, you know, true estimate of the numbers of turtles that are actually in the survey area. So up the top, you know, a typical drone survey, we, we go out, do our drone survey, we analyse the uh, images, we detect and identify the turtles, and we get a raw count of the visible turtles. So the bottom is where we're trying to, uh, um, my research is trying to account for those turtles that are not visible. So combining the detection zones and the depth usage, we get that detection probability estimate, which tells us how many turtles are actually available when we're doing these um, drone surveys to correct those raw counts. And then that's when we get our final estimate. So currently I'm at the, my research is currently at the process of um, still conducting the final stages of the, the detection zone experiments, so those turtle decoys. And we have now recovered all the um, acoustic tag data for, I think it was eight months worth with the help of Colby, <laughs> who's done amazing work to, um, to get that all up and running. And so we're starting to analyze that data now. So we eventually should be able to get detection probability estimates to correct the raw numbers that we have sitting there waiting. So overall, um, my research, um, we're, I guess, together trying to develop a robust you know, drone survey platform and methodology, and I'm hoping that this stands to benefit um, you know, broader marine uh, conservation and manage management efforts, um, potentially serving as a model um, for turtle monitoring programs more broadly. So yeah, it's been great. <laughs> Thank you.